I don't know if you have a sense of humor like I do. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but I get a kick out of people sometimes. You know, they'll tell me some interesting things, you know, on the internet. You know, they'll, they'll say, you know, well, if, if God is real, then let him do this. Or if God is real, let him do that. You know, this, that, or the other thing. And they're always saying some stupid thing like that. Or, well, I don't believe the Bible. God doesn't care whether you believe the Bible. <laughs> God doesn't frankly care what you believe in. Matter of fact, it starts off in the beginning, God. That's kind of the way God is in most ways. He's provided a lot for you as a father would, but after that, you're on your own, buddy. <laughs> in other words, I always find it interesting because people say, you know, well, when God finally does whatever, then I'll believe. Well, you know, that was said at one point in time in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then suddenly, when massive destruction wiped and annihilated the entire population, oops, then they believed. Of course, they were dead and in hell. Interesting enough, when Noah was building a boat, people didn't believe it. You know, they're like, "Are you crazy? <laughs> there, you know, there's no no dock, there's no you know water, there's no lake, there's no river, there's no stream. What are you doing?" And he would tell them because we're told that he preached for 400 years, basically, which is a long time. But we're told that he preached all that time that he was building a boat, you know, and doing what God said to do. And people, I'm sure, although it's not recorded, said something like, Well, you know, if God would rain down fire from heaven, I'll believe. <laughs> yeah, right. Or if, you know, if it rains, I'll, I'll believe then. Okay, cool. You know, or if God does this, I'll believe. Well, he did. And they believed. Some people think there were billions of people in the world that particular time based upon the amount of time that people lived and you know procreation such as it is and people you know multiplying and all that kind of stuff and God brought it down to one man his family now the interesting thing is that they got what they wanted they wanted God to reveal himself and sure enough when he did whoa too late the children of Israel tried the same story you know, at Mount Sinai. I mean, they've been in Egypt as slaves for a long time. Quite frankly, they've been absorbed, whether they'll admit it or not, into Egyptian culture. They acted like a bunch of slaves. So when they got out of Egypt, they needed laws and they needed commandments and they needed those things to make them into a society that could survive because they frankly had been absorbed into that culture and they were willing to even take Aaron, of all people, you know, wishy-washy Aaron, typical politician, and make him into their leader, you know, spiritual leader, and he cars for them a calf like they wanted, and then lies about it and tells Moses, no, you know, it just popped out of the fire. Right, sure, uh-huh, we got you, Aaron. <laughs> okay, but you see, God still used him anyways. But the point is this, down at the bottom, the mountain. When God started thundering and lightning and you know all hell was breaking loose, at least it looked like to them, they were terrified. They got what they wanted. God revealed himself. And they said, oh, because they knew who they were. They said, Moses, you go up. We're not. We'll stay down at the bottom. You go and tell us what he says because, quite frankly, he scares the living bejeebies out of them. So they got what they wanted the reality of a living God. It wasn't a question of a volcano or some stupid lightning storm. <laughs> Get over that part pretty quick. Interesting enough, Jesus said, you know, all the stories about, you know, three days he would rise again, you know, blah, 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 his temple would be torn down. And you know the story. You've heard it and you've seen it on TV or whatever. So you know that. But there's coming a day in the near future when God says he's going to reveal himself again. First of all, he's going to 
have some kind of army, we're told, you know, it's going to attack Israel and it's going to get wiped out supernaturally. Whoa! No, not supernaturally like television, you know, like where you get some special effects. No, God's going to do it somehow. But will people believe then? No, they won't. As a matter of fact, it says the people don't believe, even though he reveals himself as being Israel's protector. Now, in the near future, after that, God is going to pour out his wrath upon the world. A lot of people are going to, bam, in a very short period of time, die. I mean, a lot of people. I mean, we're talking billions. <laughs> It's like one third of the world gets consumed by fire. One third of the world gets kind of like wiped out by devastation and destruction. I mean, it's not going to be a question of is there climate change going on? The question is, is there an attitude change going on? Because God reveals himself. Now, the interesting thing is that even then, no, they won't believe. Because they'll say, oh, well, it's a natural destruction sequence cycle that the world goes through in cataclysmic evolution. And people will, of course, say that, even though some people will begin to have their doubts and begin to look at, uh, I don't think so. The interesting thing is that, as if that weren't enough, God says, in the near future, during that time, he's going to send angels flying through the sky. Not satellites, not your smartphone, not iPhones, because those will all be wiped out because electricity grids will be gone and you know the devastation from the atmospheric changes will just wipe out any type of polarity or you know power grid that you think you have now <laughs> by by electricity. But God says, Okay, I'm sending angels, they're declaring the gospel. So the gospel goes to the whole world, literally, finally. Not like, you know, man's going to do it. No, man could never do it. But God does. Interesting enough, those angels flying through heaven still aren't enough. So here's one fact that finds me fascinated about people that want God to reveal himself. God always said, I will be a debtor to no man. And there will be no question about who I am. So... Once he removes death from the potential of man being able to die, once man can't die, no matter what he does, whether he shoots himself, cuts off his head, cuts out his heart, or whatever it does, can't happen. They'll become like the stupid movie zombies, you know, that you see. Only they'll not be zombies, they'll be thinking, breathing, living beings. You, maybe, not me, I'm gone. But the point is, somebody will be there. God takes the universe and peels it back like a can of sardines and opens it up and reveals himself in heaven. Whoa! You want to know what God is like? The people that are living at that time are so terrified, they crawl under rocks, they head for the caves, they scream out in terror. They are so devastated by what they see, the reality of a dimension suddenly being made obvious, that they are dying, if they could have, for fear. And except those days be shortened, Jesus said, all flesh would have perished because it can't be in the same dimension as perfection. And in God's realm, there's perfection. So, here we have people getting what they wanted, finally, in the end. God revealing himself. Now, God the Father revealing himself is not a very pleasant place to be if you're not prepared. Even John was taken there and he said, whoa, I'm undone. I mean, he looked at the angel and said, hey, you know what? <laughs> I can't take this. So the angel, you know, does some little kind of thing, you know, takes, you know, coal from the sensor, you know, kind of touches his lips and says, eh, you're okay now. Because <laughs> you see, you can't be in the presence of God in sin. There's no corner of heaven with a little hell in it. There's no place for corruption to be in a place of incorruption. There's no place for unloving to be in the consuming fire of love. It's consumed. In other words, it's like a tinderbox. You know, if you get something really, 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 really dry, I mean really dry, and you put it in the presence of something that's like a roaring infernal fire, that tinderbox gets completely consumed. Poof! Instantly bursts into flame. That's what happens 
if you're not in the same dimension as God, the same reality as God, the same perspective as God, if you're not made incorruptible, if you're not made perfect, if death isn't removed from you, you will be, poof, consumed as though you were in the lake of fire. Even though there is a lake of fire and you are thrown into it if you're corrupted. But you see, the point being is that people that say they want God to reveal themselves don't get it because Jesus said, look, I have revealed the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I am perfection. I am the perfect image of God to you. And everything he said, everything he did demonstrated that. Demonstrated the proof of what God was like and what God would do. And so I find it interesting is that I would rather deal with Jesus and what he said and did than what I see going to happen in the near future when God peels back the universe and reveals himself. I don't know about you. Part of me still fears God. Oh, I know he's my father. I have talked to him and you know he talks different than Jesus, you know, and believe me, there's a difference. And um, my relationship with my father in heaven is intimate and tender at times, at times, you know, and I know he loves me, but there's, to, there's part of God that, you know, kind of, ooh, whoa, wow. Makes me a little nervous, you know, because he created me. Yeah, he created me and he loves me, but there's a part of me that, you know, because it's still sinful, it goes, eh, ooh, I'd rather be more so like Jesus and less so like me before I really see God face to face. And that's the point that's going to happen. You will, one way or another, meet God face to face. You're going to come into direct contact with the living God. You are going to get to know God as intimately and as personally as maybe you didn't know now. But God help you if you're not ready to know that later when you die. Because if you find yourself face to face with the living God, Jesus warned, don't fear him who is able to kill the body and spare the soul, but rather fear him who is able to kill the body and after the body is dead cast the soul and the spirit well the soul anyways into the lake of fire him you should fear is what Jesus said I get that it's kind of a reverent kind of like a awe kind of like a woe kind of like a oops feeling kind of like all rolled into one and kind of like ooh ooey you know kind of like ah okay God you're holy, I'm not, I admit it. <laughs> okay, you know, I'm not going to exercise these rights and privileges that I think I have. I'm not going to demonstrate my authority in your name. I think I'm just going to ask and fall under your mercy and grace and pray for forgiveness and cast my crown down at your feet. Because I think that's what really God is testing you with when he gives you authority. He isn't asking you to run out and start naming and claiming and choosing and doing and, you know, becoming some kind of you know super saint or super you know egotist you know running around being weirdo but I think he really wants you to give it back to him have you ever heard of that you know where God gives you something and because he really wants you to give it back to you back to him so that he could tell you how to do things for me that's what I've done you know I don't I don't run around you know with the you know, in the name of whatever or I command or any of these stupid ideas that Christians have Matter of fact, I'm more like, unless God tells me to do it, I don't do it. Unless God, you know, speaks to me and says, go here or go there, I don't go there. <laughs> I don't want to. Matter of fact, I ask him, please, don't take me anywhere. You're not there. Don't lead me into temptation. Don't lead me into evil. Don't lead me any place unless you want me to be there. And you're going to take care of me. Even if it's in death. So, really... Be careful what you pray for. Be careful what you ask for. Because if you really want God, He will reveal Himself to you. And I'll be the first one to be honest with you. When I had this issue with, you know, kind of like, okay, you know, I got saved, you know, and I walked in the Spirit for a long time, you know, and had all these gifts and stuff. Then one day I was kind of like, you know, laying in my bedroom, you know, well, in the living room, actually, on the couch, looking up at the ceiling, and uh, I was kind of, 
belligerent Christian, you know, a little prideful, probably. Okay, a lot, a lot. <laughs> and I'm laying there and going, you know, God, I don't get this fear of the Lord stuff. I don't understand it at all. I don't, I don't really know the difference between you, God, and Jesus. You know, I understand Jesus as my brother, so to speak, but I don't really understand you as God. Well, for the next hour, I found out what God was like. And whether people accept it or not, I just tell them, look, I didn't breathe for an hour. You know, that was easy. I was laying there, and God kind of like took over, you know, and the ceiling was gone, and there was a swirling mass, and there was no doubt of who was there, what was there, how he was there, and what he was doing. I had no doubt at all. <laughs> And I walked away with a very humbling experience that has never been removed from me or in my memory ever. It is vivid today. <laughs> oh, yeah. As it was back then. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. And it could be right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of like dealing with Jesus you know, in a personal, intimate way more than I like dealing with God directly. Because personally, I'd rather have the Son of God intervening and interceding on my behalf than me trying to, even though Jesus said God loves me, talk, act, and be in any way unpleasing to him in some way that God is going to soon reveal himself. Be very careful what you think you want because God will remember the things you said, even every idle word spoken in darkness or, you know, in conversation with other people, or posted on the internet, or somehow, you know, your theology. Be very, very careful. I really enjoy this one pastor, you know, recently that uh, has come on the scene, you know, and he's, uh, you know, kind of got an interesting perspective that he brings out about God, you know, and it's um, Francis Chan, you know, he brings out, you know, first, you know, some teachings on hell, but also this whole idea of God is beyond our understanding. God is bigger than we are. You know, the best that we can hope to comprehend is sitting right here. You know, in our laps if we have one, or in our hands if we hold it, or in our mind if we study it, or in our hearing if we listen to it. But quite frankly, there's more that we don't know and ever will know than what we do know, and that's kind of awe-inspiring because God isn't messing around. He's pretty serious and he's just long-suffering to let you kind of like take enough rope not to hang yourself but to fall down enough times to finally get the picture. Because you see that's what I think God does with his long-suffering is he lets you experience life and him for a while up to a point. He lets you get away with so to speak murder until finally you realize there's got to be more to this than life, you know, of what I get to do and want to do. There's got to be more to living than selfishness and self-centeredness of my own egotism and my own humanism. There must be something more to this Christianity than what I see in the church or in religion or in people's lives. There must be something more to the universe than what man can see, touch, feel, prove, experiment with, and kind of like get really humbled by. How come we don't find other life? And the reason is simple. God said. And that's the point. What has God said? And do you really want to know? I hope you deal with Jesus on a personal level. Because Jesus said, you must be born again to see God. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father except by me. Jesus said quite a few things that once heaven is pulled back and revealed and death has been removed from the earth, I don't think anyone from that point on really gets saved. I think they all wind up burning in hell. I could be wrong. Scriptures aren't clear on that point at that point in time. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God, we're told. And it is. And it's meant to be. Because 
God is holy. God is righteous. God is true. Yes, His mercy endures forever. But you know, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God.